Today, Shanghai is the Paris of the East, the commercial center of East Asia, and many think the city of the 21st century. But few of us in the West know much about Shanghai's early days, when it was the most exotic and exciting city in the world. This is the story of Saratoga resident Marie Bell, one of 17 children of Shanghai business tycoon Joseph G. Bell. She tells her story about life before and after the Japanese seizure of her father's property, life in a prison camp, and coming to America in 1943. I am Marie Bell Buselik. Yeah. And I was born in Shanghai. I think, I think my father and his brother were the richest people in Shanghai. Oh yeah, there were other rich people too. There were a lot of rich people there because Shanghai was international. We were under the French law because the French uh, had, had the best place in Shanghai and we lived in the French concession. My father uh, was a builder and he had many, many, many houses. All his houses were rented. He never sold them. He rented them. So he had many, many tenants. Many, many tenants. You see, my father and his three brothers were orphaned. So they were put in uh, orphanage because his mother, when her husband died, couldn't take care of them. So she put them in the orphanage. And then the orphanage was run by the Jesuits. So they had a wonderful education. They were four grown men, and each one was wealthy. My life was a life of luxury. We had 27 servants, men servants, and five Chinese nannies who took care of the five babies. And uh, my brothers all went to private school. I went to school by uh, car. The chauffeur drove us to school. And, and, and the chauffeur would pick us up after school and take us home. And when we got home, the servants helped us get undressed from our school uniform and he could play. And uh, my mother had so many children going to school. My father had many houses, and one house he had in front of our big yard, and it was the kindergarten. So all we had to do when we were little was walk out the gate and into one of his houses and her name was Mrs. Pavey, and she came from England. Time. Yeah, when I think about, back about that time, you see, I was the ninth child, so I really didn't count. I didn't have any, uh, what's the word? Uh, power, no power. But when we went into prison, I was my mother's right-hand man because all my other brothers were here in the States fighting the American war. And when my mother came to America, she didn't know how to do anything. So I had to show her everything. And, uh, but we, we got along beautifully because we were Americans and put into prison by the Japanese all the American teachers that taught school at the American school 
were put into prison with us. And all the Catholic priests who came from America were put in uh, to prison. In prison we didn't have enough to eat. And uh, we were scrounging all the time. And of course the Japanese couldn't supply, couldn't supply food because they didn't have anything either. In fact, they used to ship in molded bread. Bread was green and they couldn't eat it. When we arrived in America, the American Red Cross sent us all to dentists and eye doctors and all that. Tremendous, uh, and the and the uh, missionaries didn't have much either. Now this is my big brother Joe Bell, Joseph. Joseph Vincent Bell, is that right? You got it right, you do. <laughs> and he is number, uh, number six. My mother had six boys before she had her first girl. And then John was born. Yeah. <laughs> right. I can, no, no, Marie, Marie, I can still Marie. see John oh. playing football for, with Fukunz. You yeah. know who Fukunza is? Yeah. Who's Fukunza? The chauffeur's son. Our Chinese chauffeur's son. Yeah. This is my younger brother. He is number... Are you 13? He is number 13. I am number 9. He is number 13. Tony and... Mark Anthony. Yeah, that's right. Remember? Mark Anthony Bell. I had 11 brothers and five sisters. My first memory is my armor. Do you know what an armor is? An armor is a Chinese nanny. Chinese nanny. A Chinese nanny. My mother had five Chinese nannies for the five babies. <laughs> <laughs> and we loved them more than our mother because she slept with us, fed us, did everything for us. What did your father do in Shanghai? He <laughs> owned property. <laughs> he owned half of Shanghai and he yeah, got was to very, very smart. He didn't uh, sell the houses. He built them and rented them out. Marie, what was your house like in Shanghai? A mansion. A 35-room mansion. Four stories. Four stories. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a big house. It was a big house. Yeah. We had room for everybody. Even priests. 27, I think, yeah. 27 men yeah. servants and 35 in all. Two tennis courts, well, a grass one and a cement one. Uh, Marie, you had a lot of priests and nuns coming around to the house? Yes, because they were missionaries from America. And they stopped at our house before they went into the interior. Mm -hmm. Who was the first member of your family to settle in China? Ed. No. The first member of the family yes. was my grandma, Nellie Hooper. She was sent by the Anglican Church to be re represented in China. And my father was born in 1881, and, and Nellie Hooper was uh, uh, older than my dad. And she was the first, well, what happened was her father, Captain uh, George Edward Bell, went to 
uh, stopped in Macau and married a Cantonese girl. Uh, my grandmother was Cantonese, full Cantonese. She couldn't even speak English, even when I was alive. At the time, were you aware of how well off your father was? No. We never put on airs. Uh -huh. What do you remember about your mother? She was wonderful, but she didn't have to work. Of course. But she was my father's secretary. She could type, shorthand, and she made up the letters and type with two fingers. <laughs> remember? Two fingers. And she was 10 years younger than her husband. Yes. What? Yes. Almost 10 years younger than ten that. 10 years. Huh? 10 years. Yeah, ten, that's what she said. 10 years younger. And what happened was my dad's best hunting pal, hmm. Uncle Vincent, he went to his, he was best man at his, his, uh, wedding. At his hunting pal's wedding. Mm -hmm. And she was my mother's older sister. And that's how my dad met mum, right. met my mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You were living kind of an idyllic life. When did you first sense that, that, uh, that something was about to change? I think the, uh, the Japanese uh, uh, were there in Shanghai. When did you begin to notice that something was turning wrong in Shanghai? Well. We never thought Japan would take over because they used to come to our house and put stickers on, on everything, say, this is no longer yours, this belongs to the Japanese emperor. We never thought that would happen. We never thought that would happen. But it did. Six months before Pearl Harbor, we knew something was happening and my parents had arranged for us to come to the United States. We had book passage on the ships and it was delayed because Marie was sick in the hospital. Right. So they postponed it for another month and then we were supposed to go the next month. Again, someone else was sick, we postponed the trip. The result was December 8th, not December 7th, December 8th took place and the city of Shanghai had bombing activities and there was an American ship and a British ship that were taken over by the Japanese, Japanese Navy. That was on December 8th in Wusun Harbor. So on that date, we became prisoners of the Japanese, December 8th, 1941. And as a result, the Japanese sent a fellow by the name of Sato. But Sato was the Japanese representative, and he was, every morning he came to our house and had breakfast with us and everything, and he oversaw that we didn't take anything from the house out, because oh. technically everything belonged to the Japanese government. Hmm. And they kept us on, on a sort of a house arrest until the Great China University was converted into a prison camp, and that's where we had to go. GCU, Great China University, in Chape. And we called it the Chape Civil Assembly Center. We couldn't stop them. They were army people. They, they held guns. And I'll tell you something. They used to put these paper stickers on every furniture. By afternoon, the, the stickers all fell off, so we picked them up and put them all in one drawer. <laughs> 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 and you know the Japanese couldn't speak, speak English. They couldn't read or write. They were ignorant. They were, the majority of the people in China were illiterate, the Chinese, because they're too poor. They can't even have enough food to eat. What was your father's reaction when they started putting stickers on your property? He didn't. I don't think he believed it would happen. 
impossible. And he had just come to the States. So then just what? Just left with Paul, my brother Paul. So then what happened? How many went into prison camp with you? We, was, yeah. we were 18 in one room. 18 people in one, and it was an old school. So, average four families in one room, four different families. But since we were 18 of us, we occupied the whole room. So we were lucky that way. And did they separate the men from the women? Mm. No. no. Okay. They kept the families together. Okay. That was one thing. Yeah. And How long were you there? I was there only in camp seven months. Something like that. Yeah. Seven months. Was your, your father was there with you? Yeah. We were all in that one. But then my father uh, was in, in prison for three years. He was considered a military age, so they kept him. That's right. Mm. They wouldn't let military age come to America to fight the war against them. So they kept the men in camp. So Ed, Frank, Ag, Sis, Sis begged to come to our camp because she was British, but she wanted to be with her sister Aggie, so they allowed her. We had to line up for everything, even to go to the bathroom. <laughs> but you enjoyed it, didn't you, Mom? Being, uh, having the freedom of living in Yeah, it was different. To me, you know, well, like, like they say, I was sick. I almost, I was dying mm. before I went into camp. It's a miracle I survived. Yeah, you, you really. I, was, lived a very I, had, sheltered life, so. I had dengue fever. Yeah. They were dropping like flies in Shanghai. Yeah. I was in a coma and my mother had all the priests, Catholic priests come and pray over me when they came to visit us. And the, the hospital was way out, like in Timbuktu. <laughs> And the priest would come and they pray over me. And uh, I was unconscious for six weeks. Mm. You know how I got out of it? <coughs> well, St. Teresa said to me, and they were all praying to St. Teresa. Do you know St. Teresa? Yeah, praying to St. Teresa for me because my name is Marie Therese, and uh, in my delirium, Saint Teresa appeared to me, and <laughs> she says, "Marie, do you want to come to heaven?" I says, "Not yet." I woke up. Did you know that? Isn't that something? Look at me, still here. The girl, the women had to do scullery work. Sit in the, in the uh, kitchen and peel potatoes or what. It wasn't too much. And uh, do that every morning. People. And my cousin, she was in charge. See what happened when we went to prison? They got all the American school teachers in prison. And because the teachers were in prison, they decided to teach us. I graduated in prison. Did you have much contact with the Japanese when you were in prison? No, because school teachers ran the camp. My father was a policeman in the camp. They had, we all had duties, you see. Yeah. And then when they had the exchange, Daddy was going to get on the ship. He was starting to 
get on the bus to go with us to America and they pulled him off because they didn't like that, my father. And poor guy, that was awfully hard on him. He was there for three years. Who brought him? Joe brought him. Joe, Joe, you brought him home, didn't you? What'd you do? You, you released Daddy from prison. He said, what the hell? You were supposed to be something. I, I was in the hospital in um, Barry. So they said something happened to me in Barry. I wasn't supposed to be alive, or I don't know what they, they didn't know. But when he saw me, he remarked me. I was in uniform. I was a jumper. And I went right in. I picked up my 45, <laughs> and they had a Japanese guard. And I was ready to shoot it. Oh. You know, I, was, I went right in and asked where Dad was. They knew where he was. And I got, he got Ed, Frank, and the kid, and we all piled in this car. And we went to the main house. And the main house had the servants, the old servants, some of the servants there. Yeah. Um, what happened, a Japanese colonel took over the whole area, that building and everything, and kept the servants to look after the house. We had a house, ni nice house. We had two tennis courts, one cement, one lawn. We had our own swimming pool. We had a stable for horses and cows. That's right. And we had everything. Yeah, it, was, it was very yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's another long story. That house is now dedicated as the red brick house. And if you go to the computer and say Shanghai and the red brick house, it'll get you right to that house. Well, I'll tell you what happened when we made the exchange. Two ships. We were on the Japanese prison ship with no food. And the Americans, the Japanese from here, were on the grip zone, the luxury liner. Well, <coughs> we starved on this ship. And uh, when we landed, the two ships pulled up together in Goa, India. And we got onto the Gripso, and they got onto the Japanese ship. And he felt, we felt sorry for the Japanese from America because they, the, the Japanese didn't have any food. And they were, they were used to luxury here. They had white boots for their children, beautiful clothes, beautiful luggage, and here we were, nothing. And we had the nuns, American nuns, and American priests, and every night they, they sang uh, a song to Our Lady to guide us. Okay. And we never had a rough night at all. <laughs> yeah. And we were on the ship three months that's how they got by the submarines, submarine, German submarines, mm -hmm. so they didn't sink the ship. And, and the ocean was mined uh, because yes, of the that's Japanese. That's how they had to go yeah. around the world. Yeah, the ocean. Across the uh, uh, Atlantic. And when they got on the grip zone, what happened? Oh, is what time, well, right? the grip zone, you came to the States. Yeah, but, yeah. but, they, uh, but we were starving, you know. But it, uh, when we got on the grip zone, here they had a big smorgasbord. You know what a smorgasbord is? Yeah. And there was a fella handing us, each one of us, a big bar of Nestle's chocolate. Each one of us, can you believe? We landed and they put us in a hotel, the Van Cortlandt Hotel, a flea-bitten place in New York. <laughs> and they found us this house in Detroit, two bedroom house, and I think there was about nine of us in it. They had to take turns to sleep in the beds. One worked nights, so he wouldn't sleep, he sleep there during the day, and at night somebody else was sleeping. Mm -hmm. I had a brother, uh, Barney. Barney, Barney. Barney. Barney, that's right. 
Uncle Barney. He was a he was a tool and die man. He made he, he inspected tools. He got me my first job. Inspecting. In inspecting airplane parts. Mm. And the mechanics were all outside, and we women were all in caged, so the men couldn't get to us. I, I was I, going on 20. Mm. Yeah. And so I was an inspector, and of course, Barney saw me all the time, and he got me the job. I got paid a dollar an hour. That's a lot those days. And of course money mum money went to mum. But anyhow and I, I felt very I actually I felt very proud that I could do this. I filled applications out before and this one this came and on that application, what did you say? Marital status. Marital status. Hmm. I know what status is. It's height. What's marital? So I didn't know what it was. So I put down medium. <laughs> <laughs> she got the job. <laughs> and they hired me. And they hired the lady that drove me because I worked nights. Nice. And they all ran down there to see who was marital status medium. What do you say? I don't understand. I don't understand myself. And so, wave goodbye. Everybody wave bye bye. Ni hao. Ni hao. Hao hao. Ding ha. Ding ha. Thank you, Mel. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mel. I hope you heard it all. I hope it. Look at his eyes. He's glazed over. He you got a lot of, you got a lot of furniture over here. Nobody. Yeah. <laughs> it's more normal. It's crazy. It's crazy. But he'll edit it out.